Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather together this morning, we can look around and we can see brokenness in this world all around us. Lord, we also know that we don't have to look very far to see it in our own hearts and in our own lives. After the fall in Genesis chapter 3, we see how sin has ravaged this world and has brought brokenness into hearts and lives throughout, throughout the course of history. Lord, over the course of the next couple of weeks, we're going to take a look and see what does that mean for us as a congregation, for all those who have joined us who are currently feeling broken. Lord, we ask that during our time together, you will wrap your arms around all of us and remind us that you are a God who seeks to restore those who are broken. Lord, also for those who have gathered, we ask that you will mold our hearts so that they will be more like yours, that we will be a congregation that will always be a place for those who are broken who will find help and healing in Jesus Christ. We ask it all in his name. Amen. We're going to spend a few moments here in the introduction just trying to kind of lay some groundwork about this whole concept of broken church. What you have on the screen in front of you is actually on the cover of of your study. We live in a sinful, broken world. That means not only are we broken by sin, but we interact with people whose lives are broken as well. Odds are we know someone who is struggling with some sort of an addiction, depression, or some mental health issue. Our call as Christians in the midst of brokenness comes from Jesus. When Jesus saw hurting people, he drew close to them, cared for them, and sent his disciples to care for them. Our call then is clear. We must seek out the broken even when it is messy and difficult. The church without the broken is a broken church. We are the agents of hope led by the Holy Spirit to share the love of Jesus with the hurting and point them to a Savior who loves them dearly. So if you take nothing else away from our three weeks together, I hope this sums up some of the things we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the world in which we live and where people are broken and they need help. And God uses us as individuals and can use us as a congregation to reach out and help those people because we have the one who can make people whole and that's pointing them to Jesus. So if you flip... To uh, the introduction, I'm just going to share a couple of slides with you. There's lots of information, so just take in what you can. We were going to use some technology, but uh, we're having a little bit of an issue with the internet on that computer, so I'm just going to kind of sum this up. Lady Gaga, I am not citing her as a religious source, so just please know that. So if you're taking notes in the margin, she's not... She's not uh, a doctor of any sort of theology, but she gave a speech the other night uh, as she received an award. But was, what was interesting is it made the national headlines because it turned into a 23-minute speech in which she talked about a number of mental health struggles and issues that she has had personally. And not only that, she made some comments about how much the topic of mental health is becoming a worldwide crisis and that it needs attention, otherwise it's just going to stay in the dark. And uh, of course, it kind of made the news and made a lot of headlines. I only cited it because even, even superstars or people who are in the limelight, like someone like Lady Gaga, is not without brokenness. And maybe in a weird sort of a way, she used a platform in which she received an award and turned it into an opportunity to really call out to uh, those who are in attendance about the need for bringing this topic to the surface and trying to help people. And if it's something that she struggled with, and we're going to see in the coming slides, that it's something that a lot of people are actually wrestling with. And so I only share it in the sense of This is something that's probably going to get more and more attention. And so we as a congregation, we have started down the road and hopefully this will help move us a little bit further. So here we go. Uh, This is taken from the National Alliance of Mental Illness, NAMI. 
if you want to make note of it. They've got a, a nice website. You can get a lot more information. I'm just going to kind of give you the snapshot of some of the things that are up there. So about one in five adults in Amer America experience a mental illness. So I'm just looking at the room this morning and we've got, let's just say, about 50 people here. So that means that this entire table and maybe a portion of this table are all people. If the statistics are accurate, we've got people here this morning that fall into one of these categories. I sometimes think that we are people that like to think that the problem isn't with us. It's somewhere else. It's someone else's issue. It's not my issue, but someone else is dealing with it. But the reality is it can be in your own home. It can be in your own life. And so these are real, these are real topics. These are, these are definitely close to home for some people. So I, I want to front all of this by saying it, if you are one of the, the people that is struggling, uh, there is some stuff that's, that's in your packet that's intended to be helpful and give encouragement. So we will get to that. Uh, but just interesting to see the, the facts that are out there. Um, some of the other stuff, I found this interesting. They said that one half of all chronic mental illness began by the age of 14 and three quarters by the age of 24. So looking, looking at our audience this morning, we have pretty much everybody that has already crossed that line. So if you were bound to a life event or something else that would cause it, we've already hit it. And then on the bottom, you can see uh, all the way on the right, 18.1% or 42 million of American adults live with anxiety disorders. That, that kind of tops the chart. And I, part of that may just be the American way of life and culture. Uh, but you add all those percentages up, and you're, you're over 20%. But the reality is that some people not only wrestle with maybe one of those issues, it may be a combination of a couple. So is it an issue? Point is, yeah, it absolutely is. Here's a little bit more. 10.2 million adults have co-occurring mental health and addiction disorders. Uh, moving on to the right. Depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide and is a major contributor to the global burden of disease. I'm pretty sure all of us could probably rattle off a person or two who they have met who's struggling with some type of anxiety or depression. It's, it's almost a common way of life now. And I, and I would be willing to bet that many of you would say if those same people, how many of them would just say, I'm just going to have to live with it, right? It's just the way it is. Uh, maybe those people have given up the desire to try to find help, to try to find hope. Um, at the bottom, treatment in America, nearly 60% of adults with a mental illness didn't receive mental health services in the previous year. This is probably just something really critical to think about. And Pastor Ehlert's three-part sermon series really kind of started us down this road, but certainly an encouragement that if there is a struggle, how critical it is to reach out and try to get help. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Whoops. Okay, uh, one more quick slide on... This is just something I found um, from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. This just has to do with opioid. How many of you have heard of the opioid crisis in our country? Okay, it's, it's pretty much everywhere now. I went into the dermatologist the other day and I'm sitting in the office and they have like this humongous tablet. Like it's giant. Like you couldn't fit it in your pocket. You could barely fit it in your front seat. But like you can scroll it as you're sitting there waiting and every third slide had to do with something to do with an opioid addiction or the crisis in America. And uh, just in case you're wondering, Wisconsin is in the red, which means that uh, that's opioid-related overdose death rates per 100,000 people. 
So Wisconsin's at like, uh, it's 15.8% or something like that. So we are in one of the highest states. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a problem. So re- reality is, this is going to be another struggle. This is another issue that people are wrestling with. And why is it important for us? Because as a congregation, trying to reach people with with the good news of our Savior Jesus Christ, who are reaching out into the world that needs help and hope, we're going to have to be aware that we're going to be touching, touching the lives of people that may be struggling with something like this. All right, one last uh, statistic on mental health facts, children and teens. One in five children aged 13 to 18 have or will have a serious mental illness. So again, about 20%. Um, This is interesting. On the right-hand side under suicide, suicide is the third leading leading cause of death in youth ages 10 to 24. Any reason why you think it's that high? Yeah. Yeah, bullying, social media. Totally agree. Breakup of the family. Yep. And also, particularly if you noticed on your other map, it was all northern, which is also a statistical fact that we are short vitamin D. D deficiencies cause a lot of depression. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I I think um, social media just has all sorts of brings all sorts of challenges. I just, uh, I don't know if any of you are GMAers. I do enjoy just catching up on the news, Good Morning America. They, had, they did like a little special the other morning with, they took like a dozen teenage girls and the challenge was they had to give up using their, their phones and social media for two weeks. And you would have about thought that these girls were gonna die. I mean, I'm not kidding you. Uh, you know, some of the girls talked about they were actually physically sick for a few days till they finally got, like, disconnected from... Because what were they thinking? What if someone posted on my wall? What if something happened? One of the girls was like, I, I don't know if my, if my good friend broke up with her boyfriend or not, and I don't know what's going on. And you and I might chuckle at that, right? But for someone in that age group... That is that connected? That's some serious stuff. So they're having withdrawals? Yeah. Yeah, almost. I mean, you know, if you drink a lot of caffeine and then you have that morning where you don't drink coffee and you don't feel right? Similar, maybe. But uh, is that a cause? Probably. I I think... uh, Sandy highlighted broken homes is another big one. Uh, what a, you know, every kid, I think, I think on the outside, they give this impression that the only thing they don't want is structure, right? They just want to be able to do whatever they want. And yet what kids really thrive under is a structure, right? An environment where they know they're safe and they're protected and there's boundaries and structure. So... Based on the facts you see on the screens above, what does that suggest about how we should be viewing ministry here at Beautiful Savior? What what does our ministry need to look like for the world and society in which we live? What do you think? Yeah. Huge, huge, Dick. Uh, If you didn't hear, Dick said, we've got to be willing to welcome everyone, and sometimes there's a perception of you're not welcome here, right? If I heard you right, Uh, I agree. Whenever there's a problem, you have to first recognize that there is a problem. Like if if we're totally oblivious to this being reality, we would be less inclined to try to do anything. So until you know, it's hard to solve a problem that you don't realize exists. Absolutely. So if, if I'm, 
hearing Ken mention about we have to know that there's a problem. So bringing in awareness, right? Yes. An awareness uh, ourselves personally and as a congregation that this is a real struggle. Awesome. Good. Were you going to say something? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Mary Jo. But knowing that somebody has a problem doesn't really help them unless you're trained or um, able to help them. If you just pass the word around to somebody and somebody's got a problem, yeah. you're not helping them. And gossiping about them. Yep. You, you highlighted a big point, and we're going to talk a little bit about, I don't, I don't know if there's anybody in here that is a trained professional on dealing with specific mental challenges, but I do know that God has given us all tools, every single one of us sitting in here this morning, to encourage people, to be a resource for people, to be a shoulder to cry on, someone to talk to. Now, does that mean that I can offer the medical professional advice that someone needs? I don't know that I can, but I can refer somebody. And what I'll do is I'll have Chris reproduce uh, the that was on the back of the bulletin. I'll make sure those get handed out again as a resource, just uh, local resources for people if you have somebody. Sometimes that is the best way you could help somebody. I'm going to pray for you, and let me help you find somebody who can really help you. Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Go ahead, Sandy. I think the danger here as a congregation is for us to be looking at this clinically. We're a church. We should, um, in my opinion, we should be looking at it as what Jesus did. What did he do with the man who was possessed? Okay, did he do, treat him like others of faith around you know, oh my gosh, he's nuts. Stay away, stay away. They're crazy. No, he responded with love. Mm -hmm. And one of the hugest dangers today is trying to classify somebody as being mental. Yep. And that's one of the stigmas is the name mental illness makes people think, okay, they're cracked. Mm -hmm. You know, stay away. That's not true. Mm -hmm. And not all mental illness like schizophrenia or that which can be treated by drugs, but it's still a lifelong thing. Not all mental illness is lifelong. Correct. So I think, from my point of view, we should be directing this biblically, what we, how would Jesus treat them? What should we do as a congregation should be centered there. Did you look ahead in the study? No, I didn't. Because we've got a whole bunch of Bible passages. We're going to talk about exactly how did Jesus deal with people. Because that's going to be the foundation, Sandy, for how do, we, how do we approach this topic? Because not all of us are experts. And we shouldn't try to be. And, and my goal isn't to see everybody walking in and say, oh, I bet that person's dealing with depression right now. That's, that's, not, that's not going to be overly helpful, is it? But what will be helpful is for me to say, it is so great to have you here. Come and worship with us. Come spend time with Jesus with me. That's going to be helpful because he can help them. He may use me as a, as a resource in a limited capacity, but absolutely, Sandy. Go ahead, Paul. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think one of, the, one of the most critical things is we, we live in a culture, I feel, that what do we want to do? We love putting labels on things, right? Everybody's got to fit in a box, right? Okay, so you have these five things going on that means you're this kind of person. Instead of us looking at every person as a soul for whom our Savior Jesus bled and died, 
then we can say, you know what, I don't know what box you fit into and that doesn't really matter. What matters is that I love you and I have a Savior that loves you and we're going to be a place where you can belong, where you can feel welcome, where you can feel at home. And I think that's a challenge because I think as congregations and as people sometimes we like to see everything neat and tidy and clean. And sometimes when you're dealing with people that are going through some significant struggles, it's not always that, that neat and tidy and clean, is it? And as Paul said, what do those people need to know? That someone loves them and cares for them and can, and can support them. So, yeah. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing, by the way. This kind of jumps us ahead a little bit, but it just feels natural to just mention it now at the very least. Who knows how many countless people, Mike, that you might be able to help? you, you You have a situation that you have been able to find help in, and now you could be a resource to say, hey, when I, just what, what you shared with me, that's, that's an incredible, when it comes from someone who's wrestling with it, right, doesn't it mean a whole lot more? If I meet someone who says, I'm struggling with X addiction, but I've never had it, what's the worst thing I could say? I know exactly what you're going through, right? What are they going to say? Ah, baloney, you can't help me, right? You're full of it. You have no idea what my life is like every day, right? That's what they're thinking, But I can say, wow, let me pray for you. Is there anything I can do to help you? That that means a whole lot. That comes off a whole lot different, doesn't it? Okay, we kind of already got into the next question. Whether it be an addiction, depression, mental health issue, or personal struggle or crisis, why do you think people often avoid discussing or seeking help? Yeah, huge, huge, right? All of a sudden there's a crack in the armor, right? Mike said they're afraid that it's going to reveal some sort of a weakness. That's huge. They're afraid people will treat them differently when they find out that they really have that issue. Excellent. Yeah, they're, the fear of I'm now, I'm now labeled something and so everybody's going to maybe think Maybe, Sandy, to your point, right? Well, I'm cracked. I'm a weirdo. There's something wrong with me. And that's not the case. And that worry is justified. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. About people knowing and judging me. Oh, I thought you meant to say that you really are cracked. <laughs> okay. okay, yeah. Go ahead, Ken. Often people are in denial of the cycles of addiction. They, they don't even want to recognize it. I mean, you certainly can't bring it to their attention. They know there's a problem, and they're not willing to admit to that being the problem. Yeah. I mean, I just, I just think about it like this. If I were to walk in as a guest, hi, I'm Justin, good to meet you. I'd just like you to know that I've been struggling with suicidal thoughts this week. You think you could help me? Oh, how many people would do that, Right. I mean, if you're wrestling with that, are you really going to tell somebody? You're going to say, my goodness, there's nobody that I want to share. And yet, what do you want to do? You absolutely want to share it, and yet you're saying, who can I share it with? I I don't want to tell my friends that I've had suicidal thoughts. Who do I reach out to? People are definitely going to look at me weird if I say that. Off if everybody else around you would be better off if you were dead. 
these are some of the things that I was experiencing. And uh, I did seek help. They put me on medication. But that wasn't the problem. The problem was the people around me were constantly, you're worthless, you're worthless, you're worthless, until I, I guess I am worthless. I forgot that God does not make mistakes. Mm -hmm. I am worth a lot. I was worth so much that Jesus actually died for me. You're absolutely okay. right. So I'm more valuable than you know. But I didn't have the strength to see that. And so one day in the middle of an argument, I took the bottle of medication and fine. You can all do without me. But I didn't die, thank the Lord. And um, But you know what? When I was reaching out to help to my congregation, I don't want to get involved. We don't want to get involved. That was the reaction I got. I had no one. A lot of it was coming from my family, so I had no family to help me. I had nobody to help me until finally, uh, when, um, <laughs> when I did do that, the doctor was a Christian, and he actually helped get me back on track, and I realized never again is anybody going to tell me that I am not worth my Lord and Savior. But that takes somebody who has the same faith being supported mm -hmm. and letting you know and reminding people you are valued. God does not make mistakes. Now I'm not depressed, I'm not suicidal, but and and when I get into a situation that is still beating down on me, I know now to walk away. Okay. This is not healthy for me. Back to the Bible, get away from these people that are doing this. But it took somebody who cared. Mm -hmm. Sandy, first of all, thank you and for sharing. Whoever is here want to label me as correct. Yes. Yes. As my last congregation, not my last one, the one before that did. Uh, go ahead, I don't care because I'm one. I'll speak for myself. We love you because you're saying <laughs> Sandy, we, Sandy, we love you. I took, you have no idea how hard that was. And thank you for sharing. Thank you so much for sharing. Sandy, if I could just build on what you said. Okay, you made a comment about you were at a place where people didn't really want to support you. They didn't want to get involved. I, I, hope, I hope that served as an awesome springboard for why we're having a Bible study like this, Sandy. Because while we're not going to be experts on mental issues or any type of other issue, what if we could be a congregation that loves and supports people who are in a situation like you found yourself in? Because isn't that exactly what you need? That's what you needed, and that's, that's, what, that's what this whole Bible study is intended to be, is to encourage us to be people who look out with the eyes of Jesus, who but care and love for people. Being hip, I was raised in a Christian day school. I went to a Christian high school. I had some Christian college. It's, and it's still, even though it was all in my head, there was so much belligerent attitude that it got shoved away in the back. I needed somebody to re really remind me and show the love of Jesus to me again. Absolutely. And, and it, unfortunately, it took somebody who wasn't at all related. And where I learned, and I say this for anybody else here who's struggling, there is a family of believers. If your earthly family is turned on you, there is the family of God, which is ultimately the family we all belong to. And you can reach out to them. Just if you can't your own physical family, earthly, there's the family of God. I'm sorry. No. It's a it's an incredible story and testimonial about the way God uses people and sometimes the most unlikely people. And I always think about that. You, God could be using you in somebody's life in a way that you will never know until you make it to glory. And you will find out that God was using you to support somebody who was about to jump off the Leo Frigo Bridge. And you never knew it. You just never knew it. And yet God was using you to be the friend and the support 
And the person that just kept encouraging somebody with exactly what they needed at the time. Yeah, the, some, of this, some of these topics hit very much close to home. And, and if, if we can find any encouragement, we're always going to find it in Jesus Christ who loves us and who can change our hearts and make us more like him. I want to read for you just a short quote. Uh, there's a couple of quotes in your study, by the way. This is from a book entitled uh, In Every Pew Sits a Broken Heart by Ruth Graham. That is the daughter of Billy Graham. If you're looking for a book to read, it's pretty good. Uh, she's got a, she has a, kind of lays bare her heart of uh, her first marriage and the struggles that she had in it. But I wanted to read this to you because it kind of goes to this point about um, why do people sometimes often avoid seeking help? Uh, where is it now? Okay, uh, if you want to make a note in the margin, it's just page 53. I didn't include this in here, but I just want to read this to you. The wind stung my face as I opened the car door and stepped onto the asphalt. I had parked in a back parking lot. Yards away stood the building. I pulled my coat tightly around me and prepared to walk briskly to a back entrance. I was chilly, but I was hurrying for another reason. As I made the dash for my car, I said a prayer, Lord, please don't let anyone see me. I had scheduled the last appointment of the day in the hope that the coast would be clear and the building all but empty. Under no circumstances did I want to be spotted walking into a counselor's office. I got to the back door unnoticed and entered the building, stepped into a small waiting area. Then I looked up, my heart sank. Someone else was there. I thought about turning around and leaving, but I decided against it. The woman had already seen me, so what's the use? I sat down, picked up a magazine, and began flipping through it. I couldn't focus on the pages. I felt jittery, woozy. My hands were shaky. What was I doing here? What would I say? A few minutes later, the counselor called me into his office and motioned toward a comfortable chair. As I took my seat, I noticed a box of tissues on a nearby table. Eyeing the tissues, I smoothed my skirt and made, my mind, made up my mind I would not need them. And of course, she later on goes to say, of course, she would need them. What was her experience? She got to the point where she said, I need to get some help, right? And do you see how hard it was for her just to go see a counselor? What did she do? Last appointment of the day. Hopefully nobody will see me. I'll put my coat up over me so someone will, no one will notice me. I'll hold the magazine up in front of my head. Why? All because hopefully no one would ever see me. And um, if you know how, how well known the name Billy Graham is, she cites that numerous times about how could I, the daughter of Billy, and, and there's another struggle, right? Now she was worried about how she would be perceived uh, because she was the daughter of the great evangelist Billy Graham. Uh, but anyways, uh, if you would like to borrow my book, you certainly can. Uh, you're just going to have to deal with some of my highlighting, so... Uh, um, but let me know. It, it's a pretty good read. Um, it, there's, some, there's some very, she really opens up her heart about a lot of the struggle. So um, I'm going to just let you read that next quote from page 54. Uh, pretty good stuff. Um, it's just some of, the, some of the thought process about the struggles and why is it me? Why am I struggling? Why can't I seem to overcome or conquer this? Let's move to the next bullet. What things do people do to insulate or isolate themselves from the brokenness around them? And why do you think people do these things? So now we're going to flip it a little bit. Now we've talked about the struggles people have. Why do you think some people want to avoid ever getting involved? Do people do that? Do people try to stay away yeah, according to Sandy, uh, by all means, people do. Yeah. Why do you think that's the case? Sometimes you're bracing Yeah, absolutely. That was. Sometimes you're put in that box. You're nuts. Yeah.
Go ahead, Ken. I think it's just another indication of brokenness. I mean, really, we're called to reach out, and we don't. We're, we're living in there's spiritual war, warfare going on, and, and I mean, Satan doesn't want us to do that. He, he doesn't want. He wants to isolate people, and, and that's we don't, It doesn't come natural for us. That, that's really what I'm trying to say. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, uh, Mary Jo hit on a huge one. Often it's a, what would I say if I ever encountered somebody like that in the first place? I, I, read, a, I read a book about a, a young pastor. Maybe I should have just written it myself because I felt very much like he was just talking about me. But he... Um, he was talking about the very first time he had to go on a hospital visit. And he, he said he got there and he was visiting the member and he's like, he got into the room and he's thinking to himself, I don't even know what I'm going to say. And he said, what well, the crazy thing is I'm holding a Bible in my hand which I've been studying for years and yet I'm, I'm just paralyzed in the moment. And he said, the person laying on the bed said to him, Pastor, may the Lord be with you right now. And he's like, well, that's exactly what I should have said to them. And he said, I was being ministered more by the person coming to me than me coming to them. And, and if a pastor struggles, of course, I'm sure many of you sitting here are thinking, my goodness, if a pastor's going to have a hard time, what about me? And sometimes it's the simple things. Let me pray for you. Or let me add you to my prayer list if you're not comfortable maybe praying in the moment. There, there are simple ways that you can... And sometimes that simple greeting, right? God is with you. God is with you. Were you going to say something, Sam? I was just going to say, look at the risk my doctor took. I mean, do you know how much trouble he could have gotten into by saying to me, Jesus loves you, but don't worry, he sent me to take care of you? Oh my God, what a risk that is. Yeah. And sometimes it does take a little bit of a risk for you to put yourself out there. But God's never going to leave you Correct. Uh, on your own. Correct. I, I think the number one challenge is it makes us all a little bit uncomfortable. Right? And how many of us like to be uncomfortable? I don't know anybody that does. Yeah. That was, a couple, that was a couple decades ago, but just saying. The point, right? The point is pretty clear, isn't it? He couldn't find one person that even basically acknowledged him. Yeah, smile or not. Like everybody when I come in here says good morning, smile. You know, it's just that little bit of warmth that can carry you. Yeah. That's that is so huge. I cannot tell you. That is so huge. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I did, I have to admit, I did close the bathroom door, which was used by two people in nursing staff. You don't know who's on the other side. 
and I prayed with him. His body was so tense, and we talked about what he had gone through and how much. That didn't matter because right now Jesus was with him, and he knew what he needed, and he shouldn't be afraid. And he fell asleep. So I walked home, went to bed, and at 11.10, it was just, it was unbelievable. I woke up out of a sleep, and I had the most glorious, peaceful feeling. The director of nurses called me at 11.30 and said, Doug died at 11.10. <laughs> now, I shared Jesus with him, and you could really feel his body relaxed, as if Jesus was there. And took him. And his kids never showed up. His, you know, nothing. He had nobody. He was awarded the state to bury him and everything. So. Well, God bless you for yes. being there, Mary. He was there. The Lord was there. Another awesome story. Thank you for, well, I say thank you to God for giving you the courage. Did you actually tell the director, I'm going to pray with yeah, him anyway? Yeah. I took the kids. I can't think of being jailed for anything better. <laughs> Amen. I took the kids swimming on uh, Friday or Saturday. Well, my days are just washing together. But ran into my old neighbor, and he works as a therapist. He's a Christian man, and uh, he told me it, it was just so cool to talk with him. Call all the places I would run into in the community center. And he said, you know what, I, we're not supposed to. He said, I pray with every patient I can. And he said, you know what, you would, he said, you would not believe how much it strengthens me more than it does the people that, and again, I'm not saying that we're all going to walk out of here now, just let me find somebody and I'm going to pray with you. Let's pray it up. Because that's not necessarily everybody's comfort zone. But boy, if you've got a prayer list at home, I would really encourage you. And when you find people, coworkers, somebody you bump into, um, I run into people at the grocery. I ran into a guy waiting to get prescription pain medications. By the end of it, I knew half of his life story, and I said, you're going to be on my prayer list. If I ever see you again, you let me know how things are going. But let me know if I can ever help you. Again, that's, just, that's more the way God built me. But again, when you can, when you can just have a heart that says, People need help sometimes. And may God give us that spirit. But thank you for sharing, Mary. We are totally not making progress. Man alive. Uh, um, okay, we're going to move down to the next bullet. So we've got we to make some progress. The quotes are there. I think there, there's value. By the way, if you didn't write it down, um, these are all from the book. In every pew sits a broken heart. I just forgot... I apologize, I forgot to give you the actual book, but these are the, in every pew, in fact, I got a picture of it. Here it is. There's, there's the lovely Ruth Graham. So if you want to just jot that as a, as a note. Uh, evaluate, the longer we carry our brokenness alone, the heavier the burden becomes. Is that, you think that's true or not? Yeah, pretty true, right? In some, as I highlighted before, in, in some kind of a twisted way, and I think Satan is very much at play, we have things that we really want to share with people, but sometimes we don't know how to share it, and more often we don't, we're too afraid to share it, because it's going to make us look like we're less perfect than we already are. And yet nothing sometimes could be more helpful uh, one of the gentlemen that I enjoy listening to, his name is Michael Ramsden. He works for Ravi Zacharias at the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics. Way more than you probably need to know, but I really enjoy him. He's a very, very, very good speaker as far as I'm concerned. But he made a comment that he has a group of people where they get together on a weekly basis, and he said the two things we always do is any successes... We give all glory and praise to God and we celebrate as best we can. And he said, any failures, we share openly 
He said, and we never judge one another. We simply chalk it up as, God, perhaps you closed this door for whatever reason. We know that you will open another one. But he said, it has been the best thing in my life. Because he said, I have a group of people that I can share things. That I have a group of people I can come and say, you know what? On the outside, my life looks perfect, but let me tell you what's really going on inside. I thought that my marriage was rock solid, but boy, let me tell you, there are some days when it is a struggle. And he has a group of people that know Jesus, that love him and support him, and they can share those. And they pray for each other. Man, isn't that what our congregation is? A group where we come and we lay our sins at the foot of our Savior's cross. And he says, I love you. I have already forgiven you. Here's encouragement you're going to need for today. My grace will be sufficient for tomorrow. And here's a whole bunch of people that I've put right here for you that can help and encourage you along the way. Pretty awesome, right? So, uh, I do have a picture. Anybody know what that's from? Oh. You guys actually watch that stuff? What's the matter with you? <laughs> Lord of the Rings, right? The reason I the reason I have it up there, if you if you couldn't make the connection, is Frodo's carrying the ring, right? And, and is it does it get easier or harder for him? A whole lot harder, right? As he gets to the end, it's like ready to just tear him apart. And I just think about the, the, same, the same concept as some of the issues and challenges and struggles of our lives. The more we keep them to ourselves, they're kind of like the ring, aren't they? Get harder and harder and harder for us to continue to move forward because we're just trying to keep it to ourselves. So just food for thought. All right, let's turn the page. We kind of already talked about this, but I will just uh, agree or disagree the church without the broken is a broken church. What do you think? Exactly. John, that's exactly it. The church without the broken, really, it can't exist, right? It's, it's almost a statement that answers itself. And yet I think there's value in thinking about it. We are broken. Broken by sin as individuals. And as a congregation, we come together. We are a broken congregation. That means there's broken people that come here every day, every Sunday, every weekend. That means we come and we are broken. And that means then that we're also a place where people who don't know Jesus can come and they can find welcome and warmth from other people who are broken. And when we can start to welcome people with open arms, it's it's not always going to be pretty. There are going to be people that may visit for the first time and we're all going to look and say, that person just doesn't belong here. You know what? They belong here just as much as we belong here, right? They're coming for the same reason we're coming. We need help and we need hope. And, and may we always remember that. We're going to be a church of broken people and, and God has it that way for a good reason. We are out of time. And let me just, we're ending. I'm just, I, I just want to read this to you because it will move into what it means to be a broken church. This is actually from the Pilgr- Pilgrim's Progress. Have, has anybody ever read it? Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. I'm just going to read you the scene where Christian makes it to the cross. Now I saw in my dream that the highway up with Christian was to go, to go was fenced on either side with a wall and that wall was called Salvation. Up this way, therefore, did burdened Christian run, but not without great difficulty because of the load on his back. So he's carrying a load. He does a really nice job of talking about what the life of a person actually is. He ran thus till he came at a place somewhat ascending, and upon that place stood a cross, and a little below in the bottom a sepulcher. So I saw in my dream that just as Christian came up to the cross, his burden loosed from his shoulders and fell off from his back, 
and it began to tumble, and so continued to do till it came to the mouth of the sepulchre where it fell in, and I saw it no more. Then was Christian glad and lightsome and said with a merry heart, He hath given me my rest by his sorrow and life by his death. Then he stood a while to look in wonder, for it was very surprising to him that the light of the cross should thus ease him of his burden. He looked therefore and looked again, evening, even till the springs that were in his head sent the waters down his cheeks. Now as he stood looking and weeping, behold, three shining ones came to him and saluted him with, Peace be to thee. So the first said to him, Thy sins be forgiven thee. The second stripped him of his rags and clothed him with a change of raiment. The third also set a mark on his forehead and gave him a roll with a seal upon it, which he bade him look and he ran, and that he should give it at the celestial gate. So they went their way. Then Christian gave three leaps for joy and went on singing, Thus far did I come laden with my sin, nor could aught ease the grief that I was in. Till I came hither, what a place is this? Must here be the beginning of my bliss. Must hear the burden fall from off my back. Must hear the strings that bound it to me crack. Blessed cross, blessed sepulcher, blessed rather be the man that there was put to shame for me. Where did he find his greatest joy? At the cross. That's where we're always going to find our joy and our help. Let's uh, close with a blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. I had a song I was going to play, but we are so far behind time. I just, I'm not, maybe next week.